My name is Hugh Hunt and I am from the Cambridge University Engineering Department and for the last four years I've been working on the SPICE project. SPICE project is all about geoengineering, climate engineering and one of the questions is how might we cool the planet if we fail to meet our CO2 emissions targets. Now, um, one way, perhaps, is to reduce carbon dioxide levels. But we don't seem to be very successful at that. All of the, the protocols, Kyoto, Copenhagen, the, you know, are we actually doing anything to reduce CO2? Maybe, but maybe not. And I'm, I'm worried, I'm not a risk taker, and I like to think we have some kind of insurance policy. And one insurance policy is to think of ways of reflecting some sunlight. We can, like an umbrella, a parasol, can we reflect just 1% of sunlight? Now we can do that by putting particles, tiny, tiny particles, like dust, smaller than dust, into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere. And I'm an engineer. I'm not interested in the, the climate modelling so much as how, physically, how can we put particles into the stratosphere. It's a bit like if you're designing a, a car. How do you make a car that will go faster? If you're designing a train, how do you make a train to go faster? If you're designing a plane, how do you make a plane to go higher or faster? Well, we have never, we have never before put particles into the stratosphere. How do we do it? So that's why I'm interested in geoengineering. If we want to put particles into the stratosphere, well, it's a long way. The stratosphere is 20 kilometers. So if this is 20 kilometers, ordinary aircraft, when you fly to Barcelona, you fly at 10 kilometers, 30,000 feet. That's here. We're looking at 20 kilometers, which is twice as high. And up there, the air is very thin. Aircraft don't fly very well at that height. It's not obvious that it's going to be possible with aircraft to deliver the kind of quantity of aerosols. We, we perhaps need uh, 20 million tons of aerosols per year. Well, 20 million aerosol ton, well, 20 million tons of aerosols per year, that's, you know, that's maybe a hundred thousand tons per day. I mean, it's a lot of material. And if we do that with aircraft, well, is that, is that efficient? Is that, uh, is, is it cheap? Is it environmentally sensible? Are there other ways? Well, maybe we could use missiles. Or maybe we could use I don't know what, and can we use, uh, make a big tall tower, Eiffel Tower. Well, the tallest tower that anyone has ever made is only one kilometer. So to get to 20, that seems ridiculous. Maybe we could put balloons filled with aerosols, and when they get to the right height, boom, they bang, and the aerosols just burst. But then the balloon falls to the ground. And what do you do with the, the broken balloon? Because you would have millions of tons of broken balloon. Hundreds of millions of tons of broken balloon to pick up every year. Is this effective? So we have thought about all the different options. What is, what is important with the options? How long it will take to develop? and how much it will cost. And what you want to have is something which is not too expensive and can be developed quite soon. 
I think one option which might work is to have a balloon at 20 kilometers. Helium balloon, which creates lift. And attached to that balloon is a tether. It's actually a pipe. It's a long pipe. And this pipe we use to pump the aerosols to 20 kilometers. It's a bit like a, a garden hose in your garden. You water the garden with a hose. Watering the garden with a hose is easier than using a bucket, because a bucket, you Every time you, you know, a bucket is inefficient. But if you have no hose, then you have to use a bucket. But if you do have a hose, maybe the hose will be easier. Can we design a hose? 20 kilometers held by a balloon. Because if we can do that, then maybe climate engineering with stratospheric particles will be a reality. We, we should not do geoengineering. I, am, I do not think it's a good idea. In the same way as uh, if, if you were to have uh, cancer, then chemotherapy is, is maybe sensible. But if you are healthy, I don't want you to have chemotherapy. Your hair will fall out, your teeth will fall out, your kidney will fail. Why would you have chemotherapy if you are healthy? So I hope that actually the Earth is healthy, that all the bad forecasts, I hope they're wrong. So we don't need geoengineering. But if you get cancer, I would think you would want chemotherapy now. You wouldn't want to wait for chemotherapy to be developed. You would want it now. So, in 20 years' time, after all the discussions about ethics and politics, and governance and legalities and public consultation, We've gone through all of this, and we finally realized, look, the P North Pole ice is gone. Miami is underwater. Sri Lanka flooding everywhere. Bangladesh is underwater. The Maldives have gone. Amsterdam, underwater. London, underwater. New York, underwater. Los Angeles, underwater. You know what? We have to do something now. And then I say, well, okay, it might take 30 years to develop the technology. Okay, fine. Let's wait another 30 years. Now, I'm an engineer and I know, I know that technology isn't developed overnight. How long did it take to develop the Apollo space program to go to the moon. This is one small space spacecraft going to one place with fairly well-defined physics, with not many unintended consequences. The only unintended consequence might be the spacecraft crashes and you lose three astronauts. Very sad, but it's not going to destroy the planet. The difficulty with geoengineering is that the unintended consequences can be unimaginably bad. Can, we can't do that quickly. We can't, we just can't do that quickly. If the decision here at this conference is that we should say uh, research in practical hardware should be subject to strict controls, then that will slow down the research. Okay, I don't mind. That's, it, it's, it's not my problem. It's our problem. Okay, it's not me trying to do something for my benefit. 
I'm trying to do something for everybody's benefit. Let, let people make a decision. I think we need 20 years minimum to develop this technology safely, securely. And if we leave it, the longer we leave it, the shorter time we have to develop it, the more risks we will be taking. My reason for getting involved in this climate engineering research is that when I first heard about geoengineering, I thought, this is mad. Why would anyone want to do this? And then when I started looking more, I realized that the people who were, who were interested in geoengineering were interested not because they were Frankenstein, not because they were Jekyll and Hyde, not because they were some Dr. No, it's because they were really worried and because they realized that they had the ability, the information, the understanding to make a difference. People who understand volcanic eruptions can help to understand solar radiation management. People who understand the weather, climate modeling, can help to understand how geoengineering might work. People who understand the oceans can look at the effect of ocean acidifications. There are many people with expertise that can help in geoengineering. And these people are worried. They're not doing it because they want to make money. They're not doing it because they think this is fun. They're doing it because they're worried. I'm worried and I think I can help. But um, I can only help if I'm allowed to help. For the last 200 years, we have been injecting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere without control. And in the last maybe 40 years, we've begun to realize that that was a mistake. But we are addicted to it. We are committed to it. Um, what is happening pretty clearly now is that temperatures are rising, ice is melting, th th you know, th this habitat for our polar bear is disappearing. Now, it's, it, it's not just this polar bear's habitat which is being affected, because the ice that is melting is causing sea level rise, and the ice that is melting is changing the way that air circulates in the atmosphere, and it's warming the whole planet. It's changing agriculture, it's changing land use, it's changing crop success, it's changing bird migration, it's changing disease, it's changing many, many things. So you ask, um, Geoengineering seems to be very scary. That people think they should, that it's, it's, it scares them, it, it worries them. You know what? I'm worried if we don't do geoengineering. I don't think we should do geoengineering because I don't think that if, if we do it, it might be worse. I would not recommend, if you have cancer, I would not recommend that you have chemotherapy if your cancer is mild and maybe can be controlled by hormone therapy. Why do something aggressive when something gentle might be more appropriate? So I don't say we must do geoengineering. But if your cancer turns out to be more serious, and we won't know until we wait a little while, maybe we need chem chemotherapy. Maybe we need chemotherapy. Maybe it's so horrible that we have to do something horrible in return. Is this a good position to be in?
No, but why are we here? It's not your fault. It's not my fault. We can go back 50 years and say, my grandparents, was it their fault? No, it's not their fault. We go back 100 years to our great-great-grandparents. It's not their fault. We've gradually moved into this place where we are. It's, it's unfortunate we're here. I look around this room. There is all of these cabinets, beautiful cabinets. And they all have the lights on. Why do they all have their lights on? There's, no one's looking at the cabinets. And my bet is that if you go back to your house, probably, even though you're away from home at the moment, is your fridge running? Is your, uh, have you left your computer on? Have you left your uh, Wi-Fi connection on? Have you left your microwave oven on standby? I mean, probably you are using at your home maybe 400 watts of energy. Why? You're not there. Um, you know, because we don't worry about it. We don't think it's important. Now, is it important that we conserve energy? <sighs> you know, of course it's important that we conserve energy. Well then why don't we switch these lights off? Because it's not that important? I don't know why not. We've come here for a conference on climate engineering. Everybody came here by plane, probably. A few people came by train, but most people came by plane. Is that a sensible use of resources? Well, to be honest, it's been a very interesting conference, but maybe it could have been done a different way. We had a, a presentation this evening about how we could transport ourselves in a balloons gen with hot air. Wonderful. But instead, we don't transport ourselves with zero energy. Uh, we don't transport ourselves with zero energy methods. We fly planes. What is the carbon footprint of flying a plane? 2% of global CO2 is generated by flying planes. Now you might think that's quite small, but who flies planes? Is it people in Bangladesh? Is it people in Algeria? Is it people in Sudan? No, the people who fly planes are people in America, in Europe, in England, in Australia. That 2% of people who fly, of that 2% of global CO2 is from the world's richest people. Is that right? Now it turns out that about 15% of the carbon footprint of the world's richest people is flying. And about 15% is driving a car. And about 15% is heating the home. And 15% is electricity usage. And 15% is food. Why is this so big? Well, because we love eating meat and we transport our food a long distance. It's because we want our houses to be perfectly controlled. We don't like cold, we don't like hot. It's because we want to tr be wherever we want to be instantaneously. We have to change our habits. 